Well, before I start, I just want to also say thank you to all of the uh, organizing committee of the conference. First of all, of course, to uh, Avi and Chaya, Rick and Patty, Reuven and Benjamin, I don't want to miss anybody, Tony, Ariel, um, Guy, old Mishu, that was on the t and Michael Biener. I just want to thank you guys for... Remember not to speed up too much. You have time. Okay. Translation. Oh, we have translation. Good. All right. So I just want to say thank you. Way to go, guys. And girls. <laughs> it's wonderful. And also, we so much want to thank of our friends. They've come from so far, from the South Pacific. Amazing. Amazing. What effort you have made, we're, we're touched. We are humbled. And um, I'm very touched by your, that combination of both being humble, very humble, and very bold. I mean, you're very humble and very bold at the same time. Like, not lukewarm at all. You're either totally humble or totally bold. And we all just want to receive that from you. And uh, as I spoke to some of the leaders yesterday, the day before, that um, we as Jews and also as Arabs, we're so proud of our deal of, of tribe and covenant. But you all seem to have grasped it intuitively better than us. And we thank you for bringing back to us our own heritage, our own uh, inheritance. And it's really amazing. And also that you... Um, made this effort to come. And I know some of you got stopped on the way. It was People were spending 30, 40 hours to get here, some even more. So we just want to uh, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Amen and amen. Well, Abba, Ani Modelecha, Father, I pray that you would help for whatever you would like to say right now and do right now in the name of Yeshua, that we would be able to do that. Amen. I want to... Um, do three things this morning, all from Revelation chapter 12. And uh, I feel that there's, there's three things that we're pregnant with it right now, but I want it to come out. We're not going to get this opportunity again. And I want to see this to come out. And I want us to start with uh, the three issues that we want to talk about. We'll go through it later, but the glorified woman. I think that God wants to birth something new about who we are as the body of Messiah, as the body of Christ, to begin to reveal who we are as the glorified bride of Christ. Something could happen right now that we could have never done before because you weren't here. And we're here at this time. The second thing is that you came in the middle of a war. And so there's something about the war. When we, f first of all, birth who we are, then we have to stand and do something about this war that's going on. I think we could change the war right here by what we're doing. But we got to focus and we got to make sure that it gets done. And the third thing is that something that's happening here, we want to release, as Rick was saying, that a tsunami of revival uh, going forth. So, uh, and I want us to, I'm really trying, I need to teach about these three things just a little bit. But that's not really what I'm doing. I'm not, this is not primarily a teaching time. I want to get this done. I feel like these three things, we have to get them done. So at the, I'm going to share briefly on it, and then I want us to pray. So God may put it on the heart of others of you here to pray, but I want us to pray hard, to pray in the spirit, to pray with authority, because I want these three things to happen. Well, let's take the first thing. Let's look in Revelation chapter 12, uh, verses 1 and 2. And it says this, uh, now a great sign, Mega Simeon, appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars and being with child, she cried out and in pain in labor to give birth. Now, I believe this is a picture of the people of God. This woman I mean, a little bit, it's Miriam, Mary, but that's not, I think, I don't think that's the main point here. I think the main point, this is a picture of the people of God. It's interesting that the symbolism through this chapter, uh, you look at the number 12 and so on, 
you're not sure. Is it talking about Israel? Or is it talking about the church? What, what, what's happening here? And the idea is that in God's eyes, eyes, there's no two different things. There's not Israel and the church. We're one together. We, as the Messianic believers and the believers from every nation, we are to be one. And something is happening right now as our friends from the farthest corner of the earth have come to make a, I'm going to add a word here, a marriage covenant with us, then, then we become different. Our marriage with you has changed our identity and our marriage, and it has changed your identity. We have become one together. There is an identity, a personality right now, a character of who we are that wasn't before yesterday. And I'm thinking about um, the language that my dear brother Najib used. I, I just, the, I, I want to say it this way, is like, you had no reconciliation language at all. You weren't reconciled. You were just who you were, you know. You're not looking to be reconciled. You're saying, I'm Israeli. I'm born here. I knew who we are. We're Israeli. You're Israeli. I'm Arab. You're Arab. I'm Jewish. So what? We're Israelis together. We're one people. That's a different kind of language. That's the language we want to speak. It's powerful. And God is looking to make us as the people of God, Jew, Arab, international, or international, Arab, Jew. We're making us into one body, one something. And that something is characterized by a woman. The, the symbol of a man throughout scripture is the symbol of Yeshua. And the symbol of the woman is people, the human race. If it's a, if I can say, you know, good girl and bad girl. If it's a good girl, it's the bride of Christ. If it's a bad girl, it's the great whore and it's the human race sinning. But this is the ultimate image of the good girl. This is the ultimate image of Israel and of the church. It's, some, it's a picture of what God wants for us. We talk about the bride of Christ. We are to be the Messiah's bride. But that bride is glorified. It's glorified. She's pure. She's powerful. She's beautiful. She's shining with light. And she is standing next to him to rule and reign. This picture here is a picture of authority. She's standing over the moon. She's clothed with the sun. That's a picture of power and of glory. This is a snapshot of God's purpose and destiny for us as the human race. This is what he wants us to be. We as men believers, we understand that we are part of the bride. We are part of the, this woman is men and women together. It's Jew and Gentile together. We are one together in coming into this position. And it's a glorified position. I think that we have not yet understood totally how glorious God's destiny is upon us as the whole people of God together. And I don't think God could have shown us that because we weren't together. Because it's not for one of us. It's for all of us. And there's something about what's happening with coming from the farthest end of the earth and with Arab brothers and Jewish and from every nation. We're in a position that God can say, now can you see the picture that I want for you? I believe that something is supposed to change in the body of Christ today by us being here. But I think it hasn't happened yet. I think it's, like it says here, it's at the breach. It's pregnant. And I want us to pray today to release that, that we become as the people of God. We become the glorified Israel. We become the glorified ex ecclesia. We become the glorified family of God together. We become the glorified bride of Christ. There's something that he, I, I feel that God wants to release this to know who we are as the people of God. Now, it's been a long journey to get here. Symbolically, I'm not talking about the, just the 30, 40, 50, 60 hours of you all traveling to get here from the South Pacific. I'm talking it's been a long journey for us. I want to say for those of us who are Jewish, who are brought up Jewish, Israeli and Jewish, to come to embrace the ecclesia, to embrace the church, is a long road. Because that's not what we were brought up with. 
We were brought up as seeing the international church as some sort of anti-Semitic sort of Nazi body. And it's been a hard thing for us to embrace it. And also as far as Arabs. So we, we have, we've had a long road to go once we, once we fell in love with Yeshua that we realized we got all of you in the package. You know? But some of you have got to deal with the fact when you received Yeshua, you got us in the package. Whether you wanted it or not. Because Yeshua, he is the king of the Jews and he is the head of the church. So you can't get him without the Jews, without the keys, the king of Israel. You can't get him without Israel and you can't get him without the church. I have to admit, I didn't want it. I wanted just him. Do you know what I'm talking about? I wanted just him. Lord, my life was a mess. I give you my life. You're the only thing I want. I didn't necessarily want all you other folks in it. I tell you the truth, I didn't want all my people in it either. You know, I mean, I don't know which one was harder. You'd have to be Jewish to understand that joke. Okay. But it's been a long process. I'm going to take just a moment to share this. I know when I, I started uh, uh, preaching in uh, 1978, I was a new believer, and I, and I came in, and I knew nothing but just that Jesus loves us. So I hadn't even read the Bible yet. I just went out on the street and started telling people, you know, giving them hugs and kisses and telling them that God loves them. That's all I knew. That's still all I know, pretty much. But as I, read, and I, as I read the Bible the first time, I had what I call the first surprise, and that is how wonderful Jesus is. I said, how can you possibly read the Bible and not fall in love with him? I mean, he's just wonderful. There's nothing here not to love. I've said that. I've said that in sharing with rabbis, saying, oh, well, I can understand why you don't believe in Jesus. You never read the New Testament. That's all I'd say to you. You can't not read it and not fall in love with him. He's so wonderful. But then as I came, I went home to my family, and then I had the second surprise. As I read the New Testament, I said, everybody in this book is Jewish. What happened? What happened? I mean, this is in the 1970s. I mean, I didn't, uh, wh what do you do? And we realized that s things had gone wrong in religion, the history of religion. And we had come back to try to understand who we are. So in those, first few, in those first couple of decades, 1970s and 1980s, we as Jewish people were trying to figure out who we were. I'm saying that in, in humility. We were so consumed with trying to figure out who we were as Jewish people that we didn't really care that much about any of you. But little by little, we began to understand who we were in Yeshua and that you were part of it. I'll tell you what I say. When I first was sent out to preach, I was told to preach Genesis 12, 3. You ever heard that verse? God will bless those who bless you. So I'm gonna, I'll go out and say, tell the people, if you bless the Jewish people, God will bless you and take up an offering. Is that absurd? That is so embarrassing. And one day I was, and then I, was, I felt bad about it. And I thought, and I read it and I said, that's not what the verse says. The verse says, through Abraham and, see, and his seed, all the nations will be blessed. We're not here to take up an offering from you. We're not here to manipulate you to give us a blessing. We're here to pass on to you the blessing of Abraham. This is our job as Messianic Jews to pass on the blessing. Not to ask you to bless us. We're here to bless you. Now that's, now that's what we're supposed to be doing. Well... We went through kind of a journey, I did, of trying to understand who I was and saying, well, we're here to bless people. And so we went out and said, well, let's, let's help to bring revival all around the world. Let's go preach the gospel of the kingdom. Let's go preach the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let's preach revival in every nation of the world. I felt like the, the Lord told us, if you, if you want to be a real Messianic Jew, why don't you adopt what was the commission of the first Messianic Jews? Acts 1.8. And you will go out and preach the gospel in every nation. And, and, and people receive the Holy Spirit. And, and that's, we, that's what we should be doing. Well, thank God we've been doing that. Do you know, in that, we saw that Abraham so much wanted a son. And God supernaturally did not let him have a son. And he had a son through Hagar. 
And before, right before that Isaac was born, Abraham came to the point and God said, listen, I'm going to have, you're still going to have your son through Sarah and he's going to carry the covenant promise. And his response to that was, Lu but may Ishmael live before you. He got to the point that he so loved Ishmael that it was, he, he, he wanted him as his son as well. And I realize this is something for us as Jewish people that we so want to see revival in Israel. It's not going to happen if we don't love our Arab brothers as much as we love ourselves. We have to have the same heart as Abraham saying, Lu We want, and it's happened to us, all of us as Messianic Jews, I can think of it. And anybody doesn't agree with me, you can say no. But we all, we all as the Messianic community in Israel, we love our Arab brothers and sisters. We love, we want to see revival. We want to see that happen. And then God said, oh yeah, one more thing. Before you get your son, you have to agree to be the father of all the nations of the world. That's a pretty big spread of love. And that's the people from every nation of the world that have come to believe in the greater son of Abraham and the greater son of David. You are our family. And so who we are as Messianic Jews includes our Arab brothers and sisters in the Lord and includes our family from all the nations of the world. We together become one. And we realize here as we've been walking together as Arabs and Jews for many years. But now that you have come from the South Pacific, the physically farthest place in the world, it's like you're, you're completing that part of the puzzle, the farthest part of the puzzle, and now we can say, now who are we, Lord? Reveal to us who we are as the body of Christ. Something is pregnant with it. I can feel it. Can you feel it? Are we pregnant with this, new, with this new level of what God wants to release? A new level of love. A new level of unity. A new level of glory. We haven't reached this kind of glory. How could God glorify us if we were only one part of the body? That wouldn't make any sense, would it? But now that we have all the different pieces putting, coming together, God wants to show us his will to glorify us together. Because the unity has to come so that God can glorify us. It's interesting. Uh, you know, I, I, we love signs here. But you know what's interesting? Right when we signed that, when that covenant was signed yesterday, the Israeli government decided to go to a unity government. Well, maybe that's just a coincidence. But I don't think so. We've been praying for that. That right at the same time that we signed this covenant of unity between us, and then they, 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 they signed an agreement to come into a unity government. Because we believe that what we do in the spirit will also be reflected in the natural. But there's something here of being this glorified woman. Let's come back and look at her for a moment. There's something here about who we are as a people together. All of you, 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 me, all of us together from the farthest islands, all the nations and Arabs and Jews together, we become a body. We become a woman together in the eyes of God. And that woman is glorious. He it clothed with the sun. There's something about God wants to, to change our understanding of who we are, that we are to be clothed with the sun, clothed with the glory, clothed with the fire and the power of the Holy Spirit. But that's not an individual promise. That's a promise for all of us together. And it's not a promise just for the church. It's a promise for Israel and the church. It's not just a promise for Israel. It's a promise for the church in Israel. It's a promise of us all together. It has to come together. You say, well, uh, well it's, again, no, but, but how, it doesn't have to be either Israel or the church. Look, that woman has two eyes, two breasts, two arms, two legs. The bride of Christ is, is two parts that comes together. It is a double dance, a machanayim, the Bible says. We are a dance together of Jew and Gentile, one new man coming together. When we come together, then God can clothe us with glory. Now I'm saying there's something now by the position that we're in that God could release a new revelation to bring us into a new state, birth something, a new stage of who we are as the people of God with more glory and with more unity.
And standing here with, with 12 stars around us, that is, that is God's governmental power. We said that the stars that were around Joseph, it's his governmental power for the whole world. Have we, did we get that yet? That God wants to bring unto us governmental power over all planet Earth and the nations? Did we get that yet that we're supposed to be? Did we get that yet that we're supposed to be standing on the moon? You might not get this because you don't, it's, it's in the Hebrew, but in Genesis 1, it says that the, that the sun is there to be the government over the day and the moon is to be the government over the night. I interpret that mean that the, that the governments of this world are all moon governments. They're not glorified governments. But the, glory, the kingdom of God is a sun government, is a glorified government. And, this way, and God is preparing all of us together to be a glorified bride that rules and reigns together with Yeshua. And we have to be clothed with glory and receive his authority and his power so that all the kingdoms of this world are submitted to the, to the kingdom of Yeshua. Hallelujah. There's something about who we are. Lord, help me. I'm not getting this out right. Lord, help me. There's something that who we are all together as a body, as the bride, that is more glorious than we've ever thought of. It's more powerful than we've ever thought of. It's more pure than we all. It's more unified than we've ever thought of. It's a rainbow. It is who we are together. It is so glorious and wonderful. And God, I feel this thing. Come on, come on. Try to understand my plan for you. Try to understand who you are in my plan. Try to understand that my destiny for you is so glorious and so powerful. Get it together, will you? And now that we're together, God can birth this in us. One last time, because I want to pray this. And in just in a few minutes, I want us to pray. I'm trying to buy this little half teaching of bringing us to the breach. You know, I want us, not the breach, but just right before the birth. I want, I want us in prayer today to birth something of us being this glorified woman that rules and reigns over the universe together with Yeshua. Oh, it's so wonderful. And we, as the body of Christ around the world, we haven't really seen it yet. But now that we're together, I believe God doesn't want to show it to us like as just a mystic revelation, but bring us in to the reality of being who we are. Amen. Let's look at the next verse. So I want us to pray in just a few minutes for God to birth who we are as the body because you were here. Because I was asking the Lord, what are we, what are we, why did we all come here? What are we here for? You know, we're here to bring us into the next stage of what God wants us. We couldn't go there without you, and you couldn't go there without us. Now that we're here, let's go. Hey. You know, we're waiting. It's like we're waiting in the parlor here to go through this door. We're waiting for, well, I didn't want to go through the door till you were here, but you're here. Let's go through the door. Let's go through the womb. Let's, pass, let's go to this next stage. And I want us to pray that in just a few minutes and birth it out. And now, the second thing is, we weren't planning this. I don't think anybody on the committee. We weren't planning to have a war in the middle of this conference. Did you? I don't know. I didn't. I wasn't thinking of that. But uh, we have a war. So that's not a coincidence. God somehow allowed this war to happen right when we're here. Well, I figure if he allowed that to happen is because he wants us to do something about it. We could affect this war today. Let's look at this perspective. First of all, you have the glorious woman giving birth. That's that's the picture of the body of Christ. Now, the bride of Christ. And the next thing immediately he says, he says, and then there was another sign in heaven. See, with the sign of the glorified bride, immediately comes another sign. And that is a great and fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. That seems to be a third of the bad angels. And threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child. That's not just Yeshua. That's also our children. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Listen, whether you wanted it or not, there's a war going on. There's a war going on right now in the natural, and there's a war going on in the heavenlies. We don't have a choice not to be in that war. We're in the war. Now, how we react to that war, we can make a, we can make a decision about that now. We can change our hearts to that. Let's notice something here. 
Did you notice that Satan is not equal to Jesus? He's sure not equal to God. He's not equal to Jesus. Where's, who's he compared to? He's compared to Michael. He was a co-angel with Michael before he fell. That's the level that he's on. He's a third level down from God. This is, he's not all powerful. And he only took a third of the angels. Well, if he took one third of the angels, how many angels are with us? Two thirds. All right. We got to, now the, the thing is, when God allows to war happen, he expects us. Hope this doesn't sound wrong. If God allows a war to happen, he expects us to win the war. To win the war. To win the war. And I want to say here, it said that and Michael overcame him. Now, the war on the ground is the secondary war. That's not the real war. This is the real war. The war that's going on here is between good angels and bad angels. It's, and our faith is the one that tilts the, that tilts the battle but between the good angels and the bad angels that are fighting over our nations. And we need to win this war. One of the things that we'll take is we need to change our attitude about God. I wonder if the people in the islands already have that. You know, but most of the people, at least in the Western church, they did, well, God, well, if this is a war, it must be of the devil. Wait a minute. God's name is a God of war. God's name is Jehovah of the armies of heaven. God's name is Jehovah that wins the battle. God's name is the God of war. And we haven't seen him that way. I mean, our people missed Jesus coming as the Lamb of God. How many of you know that Jesus is a Lamb? Well, sure he does. But he's not just a Lamb. He's the commander of the armies of heaven. And he wins. He always wins. The armies of God in heaven win. So we need to get on the side of the armies of God and win the war. And that doesn't mean that we win all the time. You all know the passage in Joshua 5. Joshua comes, he sees Jesus. He says, are you on our side? He says, what are you talking about? Am I on our side? Are you on my side? And he says, oh, yeah, okay, I understand. It's not that he's for us or against that. That's not what it is. It's he, the kingdom is his. And we have to bow to him. And when we see that it's his kingdom, then he conquers and he wins. That's where the battle is. But don't think it's not winning. Don't think it's copping out from the battle. I don't want us to cop out on this battle at this time. We need to fight the war. And we need to win the war. And I'm going to tell you what I mean by that in just a moment. You know. Now, a lot of us, my, one of my sons is on the floor. Almost, almost all of us here as Messianic Jews, we have <laughs> brothers and sons and husbands. Who are, they're all the, everybody. There's a 100% draft call up. In fact, it's more than 100%. 100% people showed up and then it was more than 100% people. Everybody volunteered just to show up. But we're in a war. So all of our families are there. There's not a mother in this country who isn't crying. There's not a mother, there's not a sister, a wife who has a, a soldier in the army that isn't, isn't you know, concerned. And I understand that. But we're in this war. And we understand that God is sovereign over war. And war has a purpose. War is a judgment of God. It is to change things in the world that are wrong. It's not of the devil. It's of God. God is the sovereign over the wars of this world, just like he's sovereign over the courtrooms. The courtrooms are there to bring someone who is accused, check the facts, find out whether he's guilty or not. If he has done a crime, the court decides it needs to be punished, and they put him in jail. That's what you do in a courtroom for an individual criminal. And you need a police to force to bring, to bring the person to justice. The same thing is true in the court of heaven. War, the soldiers are like the policemen. Not with an individual criminal, but a nation that has done something wrong. And it has to be brought before the court of God and say, is there a judgment on this situation? And if there is... That has to be brought to that has to be brought to justice. It has to be brought to punishment to free up the other people that are that are being affected by it. This is an institution of God. God is the God of war. God is the God is the is the head judge. He's the commander in chief of the armies of heaven. 
Now, what does that mean? We say this, and I'm so happy that Najib here was right before me. We, as Jewish people, we love Arabs. This is not a war of Jew, uh, Jews against Arabs. That's not what it's about. This is about powers and principalities of evil. We love every person. In fact, we love the people in Hamas. We love every single person. But there is a power and principality of evil that's of Satan, that's of this dragon here. And we've got two-thirds of the power, and we need to take that guy down. And that is a demonic spirit that's been working in the jihadists, in Islamic Jihad, in Hamas, in Hezbollah, and, 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 and in ISIS. This is a demonic spirit that we need to drive it out. Now, how many of us remember? I remember that 1970s, 80s, we learned about how to drive out a demon. Hallelujah. We used to drive out demons. Well, let's drive out a bigger one. Let's drive out. This is a, this is a big demon. Not in one person. That's in millions. Let's drive him out. And God has given a physical tool to do that, which is an army. An army is a tool of God. It has to be done righteously. It has to be done under the law. It has to be done with integrity. It has to be done with weapons purity. But it has to be one. Here's how I look at it. I was praying. I thought, well, Lord, I, 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 you told us to love everyone. I love the Palestinians. He said, really? You really love them? How much do you love them? If you really love them, what would you do? What would you want to do? If I really love the Palestinians, I would want to get that evil regime of Hamas off of them and set them free. I want to be a Palestinian liberation movement. Hallelujah. I want to set the Palestinians free from the, from the dragon dominion of Satan in Hamas and Jihad. That's what love would do. It's not love going, well, we should hesitate. I don't know what we do. We don't, you know, then, then. No. Who said it? There's a time of peace and a time of war. This is a time of war right now. I'm not talking about the Israelis versus Hamas. I'm talking about the, 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 the heavenly spirits. Our soldiers don't know what to do. They're going, the whole place there is booby trapped. I mean, we, not, we, don't know, we don't know what to do. This is a power, this is a battle of good angels against bad angels. And that's the part that we win the war. My son in the army doesn't know how to pray right now to this. I want to pray for him. I can't take the gun that he's got. He's got his part. This is my part. We got soldiers that are fighting the war, but we have to win the war in the heavenlies. If we drive out all these evil, evil demons that are over, that are over Hamas and, and, and Jihad, then the war can be won quickly. Now, just to touch another little point of there. This is why we need to pray. But hear this. Try to hear this in love. I want the war to be fast, hard, victorious. Why? Less people will get killed. If the thing drags on and we half win and we half won, more Palestinians will get killed. Hamas has to be taken down. And I'm talking about the demonic spirit of that. The far, the faster it is, the sharper that it is, the harder that it is, the more Palestinians will be set free and the less people will die. But there has been a judgment made, judgment made on that demonic spirit. I mean, goodness gracious, the left wing president of the United States can even see that. That demonic spirit needs to be taken out. And we need to pray for this. I want us to pray hard. Still, it's not getting it. But my brothers and sisters here, more of our children are going to get killed if we don't pray hard. If we pray double-minded prayers, well, God, you know, maybe this and then. Our, our children, our, my, my son, your children, they're going to get killed. And more Palestinians are going to get killed. But we want to drive out these demons and do it hard and do it fast and set these people free. God strikes like lightning. And we want to drive out these demonic spirits, save our children, save the Palestinians, and save people that are under the, under the, the, the demonic regime of, of demonic Islamic extremism all over the world. They don't want that. We've heard reports. I heard a report from our friend Basim. Uh, you know Basim, an Arab pastor here in Jerusalem. He said, from what they can set, see on the, on the post and in, in the, in the uh, social media, it's looking like 80% of the Palestinians don't want, they don't want Hamas. They don't want that stuff. And, and, um, and people are responding to the gospel. And so we want to pray. So I want us to pray to win this war. I'm talking about the war above us here. 
Let's win that war. Let's drive out these demonic spirits of, 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 of hatred and Islamic extremism and, and set the people free. Hallelujah. Now, the third thing is, you remember that we're going to pray for this in just a moment. So uh, the third thing is this. Some of you have already said that. Rick talked about the tsunami. I think that if we win this war, if we are unified as a body and we win the war, over, it's going to release a revival in this area. And here's what the next verse says. Um, can we go to the next one? Are you with me here? Verse, verse 10. You're with me. Okay, one sec. Now, what it means is that when we, if we come together and take our place as the body of Messiah, glorified, unified, receiving authority, ruling and reigning with Yeshua, then we can win this war. We can be with Michael. Michael's ability to win the war is, is partly dependent on our prayers. Let's, get, let's give the guy some, you know, some, <laughs> some fuel. You know? Let him let help him win. If that happens, the next verse is this result. Then I heard a loud voice in, in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has accused them before God. Day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives unto the death. I believe, and this is really what I would like. This is the third prayer. First one for who we are as the body. Second, win this war. But we want to get to this. The third thing is we want to believe for a revival of salvation right now. Um, particularly for those who are under the regime of Islamic extremism. And I'm telling you, we hear all over the world. I've heard this. There are people where there are more people coming to faith anywhere else in the world today is in Iran. There are people coming to faith in Gaza. People in Gaza want to know the Lord. People all over it. They're sick. Arabs, Arabs, they don't want that. Do you know the people that are opposing this right now? Putin, the, the Ayatollahs, and, and Erdogan. You know how many of them are Arabs? None of them. None of them. They're not Arabs. The Arabs are sick of this. They don't want it anymore. They're ready for Yeshua. And I believe that we can pray and win this war. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna say, hey, this Allah, this, this stuff, we didn't like him in the first place, but this sure can't be God. Hallelujah. And I want us to pray and believe for revival to spread across the, uh, across the Islamic nations, particularly the Arabic Islamic nations. No, no, I shouldn't do that. I just happen to love Arabs. But of all the Islamic nations, this, is, this could happen right now. Hallelujah. And those are what we want to pray for. And I believe that's why God's called us here today. There's a unique opportunity because of who you are. We don't need a lot of numbers. We have the representatives. We have representative authority. Oh, our worship team finally. Great, come on up. We're going to pray and worship, but I also want us to intercede. So we have a unique opportunity now because of these covenants, because of the different nations involved, from Jerusalem to the farthest place in the world away from Jerusalem. Then we have an ability to come into an agreement. And I want us to intercede. Now as our... Team is coming up. Come on up, guys. We'll see you ready. But let me say, wasn't that a nice teaching? I don't want a nice teaching. I don't want a nice teaching. I want it to happen. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened. What I just talked about, those three things, I want it to happen. And it hasn't happened. And I'm asking you in mercy and humility. My son is on the line. I'm asking you to pray. Pray hard. I want, folks, we have got to step into our identity as the glorified bride of Christ ruling and reigning with Yeshua in power and authority. We have got to come and win this war hard and fast and drive out and be there with and support Michael driving out the dragon and get him out of here and pray for our children. You see, he's out. The dragon's out to get our children. Drive out them. And then pray for revival to sweep this. It's in, your, it's in your minds, it's in your hearts, but God, folks, we're going to have to release it by faith. Hallelujah. Amen.